At church this Sunday, we're talking about Jesus warning to us that we are to show humility because the first will be last and the last will be first. And this gives us an opportunity to open up the letter of James. There's a, a great sermon series by Pastor James Hine on this letter called James. Uh, and in, in that series, he says that the book of James is all about what it would look like if we fully believed what Christianity teaches. What would it look like in our daily lives if we, we fully believed and practiced the gospel of Jesus Christ? In James chapter 2, the author of the, the letter tells us that fully believing Christ would give us a humility that would not allow us to show favoritism to the people around us at all. In this section, God teaches us, number one, that favoritism makes no sense. Number two, favoritism is dangerous. And number three, that mercy triumphs over judgment. So our first point today, favoritism makes no sense. Our reading begins with a hypothetical situation. Say two people walked into church with you on uh, for, for one of your worship services. The first man is obviously wealthy. He's got a nice suit on. He looks good. He speaks well. He drove in in a really nice car. The second man is obviously poor. His clothes obviously haven't been cleaned in a while. He could really use a haircut and a shave. Maybe he smells a little. Uh, and he didn't come in a car at all. He just walked here. James says that if we show favoritism to the wealthy man and snub the poor man, we're making ourselves judges. Now, I don't think it's a shock to anybody if I tell you that judging, judging is wrong. Yeah. Judge not lest ye be judged is, is one of the most quoted Bible passages in our day and age. We know that it's wrong to show favoritism. This is why James runs through a, a number of reasons why it makes no sense for Christians to live in that way. He points out that generally it is the rich who have the power to exploit and, and, and legally go after Christians. He, point out how, he points out how often God chooses those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he promised to those who love him. Let's think about this too. Why it makes sense. Why, why do people make these kinds of judgments? Why do sometimes Christians make these kinds of judgments? Why might somebody be nicer to a wealthy person than they would be to a poor person? Well, the first reason I can think of is, is simple selfishness. A wealthy person could probably do a lot for you, yeah? That's kind of the natural way that humans think, isn't it? We naturally evaluate other people based off what they can do for me. Is this person going to be good for me in terms of, of, of friendship or romance or, or business or whatever else? The second uh, reason someone might be nicer to a wealthy person than to a poor person is, is superficial prejudice. Go back to that hypothetical situation James brought up, yeah? The wealthy man looked nicer, he spoke better, he has a great car, the poor man looked, spoke, and smelled awful. Many people naturally associate good looks with moral goodness. Many people associate uh, charisma with intelligence. Many people associate owning nice things with being a hard worker. But do any of those things tell us anything about whether or not that man is a child of God? Ask yourself, should I, as a Christian, evaluate others either based on what they can do for me or on purely superficial matters? Absolutely not. Isn't the answer obvious? Imagine if God evaluated us either by how much good we could do for him or by how we looked or smelled or carried ourselves at any given moment. God doesn't judge us that way. He instead chooses to evaluate you according to his own mercy. He takes away all of our sins, the sins of the entire world. He gives us his own moral perfection as a gift to be received through faith, to cover over all of our faults. If that's the way God evaluates us, then it makes no sense for a Christian to evaluate others either by, by superficial or selfish standards. And this brings us to our second point. Favoritism is dangerous. 
like I said before, we know that it's wrong for us to show favoritism. The question is, do we still do it anyway? What was the last, when was the last time that you confessed this specific sin, the sin of favoritism to God? Likely for most of us, this sin really isn't even on our radar. It's one of these things that we know it's wrong, but I mean, it's not murder after all, right? Why should we put any extra effort or focus on, on this particular sin? James answers that question with our second point by saying, favoritism is dangerous. James points us to the Ten Commandments, the law of God, which is summed up in these words, love your neighbor as yourself. God's law is how God designed humanity to live. Think about that. If God created humanity, then he has authority to tell us how humanity is supposed to function. To live outside of God's will for us is to, to break ourselves and the world around us. James explains to us that, that it is dangerous to live in any sin without repentance. He writes, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Whether you're an adulterer or a murderer, you can't point to the other person and say, Well, at least I'm not as bad as you. Both people are sinners, James tells us. They've both broken God's law. Both people are breaking the world by their sin, and we do the same thing when we evaluate people the same way the rest of the world does. Showing favoritism is not treating others the way we would want to be treated. It's wrong. As with any sin, to live in it and not repent is to reject Christ. And this brings us to our third point. Favoritism is wrong. It's dangerous to our lives right now and to our lives in eternity. But number three, our main, third main point, mercy triumphs over judgment. We said this before, but consider again how God judges us. How does he evaluate you? He doesn't judge you based on how good you look today. He doesn't evaluate you based on how your breath smells. He didn't choose you based on how good you could how much good you could do for him or or how much you would contribute to the world around you instead he chose you because of his mercy his mercy triumphed over that judgment that he could have brought on us to evaluate people like the world does is completely inconsistent with our faith the more we understand the gospel the more god will lead us to repent of showing favoritism. The more we grasp our God's mercy to us, the more we will want to show mercy to others. If you and I are content to judge others by selfish and superficial standards, how can we even say we're Christians? Again, go back to James's hypothetical situation. If there's a rich person and a poor person standing there, which of those is you and which one is Jesus? Jesus is obviously the rich man, right? He's God over all. All things are for him and to him and through him. And yet, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we read, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus became the beggar so that he could give you eternal riches. If God's mercy on us has triumphed over his judgment of us, how much more equipped are we to show that kind of mercy to others? If we have received grace, let's show that same grace to the world around us. Going back to our question, what might that look like? We said before that, that this is what James is asking throughout this letter. What would it look like if we put into practice all that we believe? Well, one clear example that we might look to from history, ever heard of a hospital? Do you know where hospitals came from? Think back to the ancient world, before all the advancements in medical science, before the, the uh, quantity of, of hospitals that we have today. How did that all get started? Back then, if, if you or a family member got sick, Either your family member took care of you, or in some cases, you had to just be kicked out of society so that you didn't infect anybody else. Who do you think got the idea that they should take care, not only of their own family members, but 
other people's families. Who do you think got the idea that they should take care of people that might actually get them sick and they might lose their lives? It was Christians. It was Christians who knew that they were looking forward to the resurrection to eternal life, who decided to risk their lives to help the sick. That's where our modern hospitals came from. And there are many examples in history of, of Christians doing this. Uh, Basil, the bishop of Caesarea, Cyprian of Carthage, Fabiola in Rome, uh, the Benedictine monks in the Middle Ages in particular, were responsible alone for 2,000 hospitals. This was free health care that they came up with all by themselves, and many of them died in that work, getting sick from, from the people they were trying to help. What would it look like? If we show that kind of, of crazy, indiscriminate, and merciful love right here in our community, what would it look like if we showed grace to the, the people God has path, uh, placed into our lives? James tells us mercy triumphs over judgment. He tells us that if we evaluate people in these sinful ways that we've mentioned, then we simply don't understand grace. Grace is God's undeserved love for us. The way you and I treat others is a direct reflection of our view of God. If you see the gospel clearly, you will show grace and kindness to others. Not, not because, you know, I really should be nice, but because that's who you have become. You've become a Christian. That word means little Christ. You are a Christian because God made you one. Only because of his crazy, indiscriminate, and merciful love to you. Amen. And I say, I say, I say, can't be there.